it is very important to understand how to manage uh, the disease donor. The term solid organs had been replaced by solid organ tissue or both. Decrease in uh, antidiuretic hormones, there is decrease in uh, thyroid and what is happening in the lungs? There is neurogenic pulmonary edema, there is increased capillary permeability. Unless we educate people on the management of organ donation, I think it won't be, be half-hearted if we just pledge and we do not actually educate people about everything about the donation of organs. Dear friends, Welcome to the Wednesday webinar of uh, Indian College of Anesthesiologists and uh, proud to say that this is uh, the number one, two, three of uh, the webinars. Today's topic is uh, brain dead donor, the management of brain dead donor. And uh, this topic is very, very relevant in today's world uh, because uh, you often hear news that uh, somebody is needing a uh, organ here, somebody is needing kidney, somebody is needing a liver somewhere. So with increasing number of uh, patients uh, at the terminal uh, stage where there is no other option left uh, but, for to, but for the transplant, so the need for organs uh, which can be transplanted uh, is growing day by day. Academics, uh, Dr. Mughal Chand Kapoor, he is at the moment Chief Consultant, Professor and Head, Department of Anesthesiology and Surgical ICU uh, at the newly opened uh, Amrita Hospital, Faridabad, uh, in, in uh, Haryana and in India. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we, we decided to do a webinar on uh, uh, this brain dead, uh, management of the brain dead donors. And because uh, the number of deceased donors and transplants are increasing by the day, in my hospital itself, we have sought a permission to do transplants, not only just of lung, heart, or the liver, or the pancreas, or the, or of the uh, you know kidneys, etc. But we are also going in for transplants of whole uh, the both the hands for the shoulder transplant, penile transplant, abdominal wall transplants, tracheal transplants, and all these are going to come from deceased donors. And the uh, it is not easy to manage a deceased donor because uh, one once brain death occurs. There are so many hemodynamic altercations which occur because of the brain not functioning properly that it is very important to understand how to manage uh, the disease donors. So that we thought it will be good to brush out all these things and put it in front of all the uh, people who take part in this webinar, who do these webinars. So uh, we start this uh, and, uh, these series, uh, the webinar series by uh, by uh, a talk by Dr. Vivek Chopra. Dr. Vivek Chopra is a uh, senior consultant in anesthesiology at uh, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences and Research. And uh, we also have a medical college coming up soon. His areas of interest are ERAS in daycare surgery, regional anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia, and liver analgesia. And uh, apart from this, let me tell you, Dr. Uh, uh, Vivek Chopra, I would say Colonel Vivek Chopra, uh, Chopra was earlier in the armed forces where he had a long uh, tenure and uh, did exceedingly well in the armed forces. Over to you, Vivek. Thank you, sir, for your kind introduction. Good evening to all the participants of this uh, ICA 123rd webinar. So I, I, talk, I, I will be talking on uh, the criteria and legal issues regarding brain death. The concept of brain death is not new at the, at, at the moment, but uh, the concept of brain death as defining death is widely accepted. However, there is no global consensus on the diagnostic criteria. Why was the need for, the, for, for getting the criteria for, or for defining the criteria for brain death? It was basically because of a rapid progress in the organ transplantation and also an increasing numbers of patients in a living body, but with a non-functioning brain on critical life support due to advancements in the, me in the medical sciences, which kept them alive uh, on ventilators with the use of inotropes, vasopressors. And hence, there was a need to change the laws as the, as the criteria of brain, brain death evolved. So I'll just briefly touch upon the history. This uh, Bertrand and co-workers in 1959 reported a maintenance of respiration in a patient by mechanical vent ventilator who was dead three days prior. 
in spite of circulatory collapse and in deep coma. So then in 1959, again, Mollerit and co-workers described cessation of brain function on concepts which are quite similar to the present day criteria, which is irretrievable coma. I'm sorry, I didn't change the slide. So uh, in 1968, the committee of Harvard Medical School to examine the definition of brain death published uh, the criteria for irreversible coma, which said that the, the four criteria needed to be fulfilled, unreceptive and unresponsive patient, having no movements or breathing with no reflexes and a flat EG. So similar findings had to be repeated 24 hours later after having excluded hypothermia and CNS depressions. So this was way back in 1968. Then in 1981, uh, in the United States, they, uh, they came out with a Uniform Determination of Death Act, UDDA, which which defined irreversible, uh, which defined death as an uh, either an irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions or an irreversible cessation of all functions of entire brain, including the brainstem. So this has been accepted worldwide and has formed the basis for legal codes in many Western countries. In 1987, the American Academy of Neurology published guidelines for brain uh, published guidelines for brain dead death in pediatric patients, which was updated in 2011. In 1995, the same uh, American Academy of Neurology published guidelines for brain death in adults, which were again updated in two, uh, 2010. So these are quite exhaustive guidelines. Uh, in 1990, uh, what was happening in the United Kingdom, this is about the UK, uh, US in the United Kingdom in 1976, uh, they had already come up with a brainstem death definition for brain death. So in 1995, a conference of medical royal colleges documented the criteria for uh, brainstem death, which, and in that conference, they, they, they used brainstem death, brainstem death in place of brain death, and defined death as an irreversible loss of the capacity for consciousness, along with the irreversible loss of capacity to breathe. Now let us talk, talk about the traditional aspects of brain death. So Plato, uh, in the Greek, in ancient Greek uh, archives, Plato and Aristotle were the two pillars who postulated their concepts of life and mortal death. Plato considered death to be the separation of reason, which is consciousness from the mortal body. According to Plato, the vegetative state in today's neurophysiology was the equivalent of death. Aristotle postulated heart as the main seat of the spirit. So traditional concept of death of an organism uh, emphasized the cessation of respiration or circulation without considering the role of the brain. What is brain death? Now, there are physiologics, there are physiologic similarities between brain death and cardiac death in that both represent an irreversible loss of communication between the control center and the peripheral cells and tissues, and also a loss of modulation between uh, with the peripheral cells. So cardiac death and brain death are similar in these concepts. So when we talk about brain-related death, it could be interpreted according to the structures, namely the whole, whole brain death, brainstem death, or neocortical death. Brainstem is usually the last to be injured in brain damage. Hence, the definition of brainstem death includes an irreversible loss of consciousness, brainstem reflexes, and respiration, resulting in the death of the human being. What is the mechanism of brain death? Now, brain injury could be a traumatic brain injury, it could be a cerebrovascular accident, or a generalized hypoxia, all of which result in gross, in, result in brain edema. So a, in brain, a developing brain edema would increase inter, uh, intracranial inter pressure and will compromise the cerebral perfusion pressure. We all know that the critical cerebral perfusion pressure is between 10 and 20 millimeters of mercury. And when uh, one, the critical uh, CPP is achieved, it is, the, when the cerebral perfusion pressure is below the critical level, there is, uh, there is cessation of cerebral perfusion, which initiates an aseptic necrosis of the brain. Within three to five days, the brain becomes a liquefied mass 
and such a liquefied brain mass is generally called condition known as a respiratory brain in which the brain which is a brain status following a major global ischemic event where cerebral perfusion is not restored sustained increased intracranial uh, intracranial pressure compresses the entire brain including the brain stem with uncle and tonsillar herniation and resulting in total brain infarction or failure let us briefly discuss about the neurophysiology of brain death what happens uh, to the various functions of the brain so brain death implies loss of all clinical functions of the brain which can be measured at the bedside by a clinical examination however brain death excludes the lower portion of the spinal cord that is below c2 level some countries like the united kingdom exclude both of the cerebral cortices from their definition of brain death thus su suggesting brain stem death which does not necessitate confirmatory tests such as eeg transclanear doppler or uh, auditory evoked potentials etc for brain death a brain dead patient is believed to have no consciousness no intellectual act activity and no true humanity which is akin to the concept of brain stem death now what what happens to respiration spontaneous respiration ceases in brain death even with the psu uh, even when the paco2 reaches 55 to 60 mm of mercury hence the significance of confirming brain death by confirming apnea the cardiovascular system shows initial bradycardia and hypertension known as the cushing phenomenon followed by a tachycardia hypertension and high blood catecholamines which we call as the catecholamine surge or the autonomic storm now the sudden uh, the uh, herniation of the cerebellar tonsils is marked by a sudden fall in arterial blood pressure due to a raised intracranial pressure herniation of the cerebellar tonsils through foramen magnum onto the cervical spinal cord results in blockage of outflow of the vasomotor and cardio accelerating neurons to the spinal cord so after brain death different types of autonomic spinal cord reflexes develop now what happens to the body temperature brain death induces a state of poikilothermia which means that the body adjusts to the environmental temperature in patients after a 24 hour period following the brain death and most patients have been observed to have hypotherm hypothermia the however uh, the neuroendocrine functions in the brain uh, in brain death uh, clinical studies have shown that hypothalamic and anterior pituitary functions are preserved to a certain degree for a certain period of time after onset of brain death uh, immunity and inflammatory responses after brain death uh, are also preserved to some extent cns exerts a significant influence on the immune system brain death in itself may induce systemic inflammatory inflammation with release of inflammatory mediators from ischemic brain there could be a there is a catecholamine surge which leads to anaerobic metabolism metabolic changes after brain death may modulate inflammatory response and release of neuropeptides from the nervous system then what then the next step is the evolution of the brain stem reflexes and we all know i don't need to elaborate on them the pupillary light reflex the corneal reflex the ocular cephalic reflex which we know which is known as the doll's eye reflex ocular vestibular Uh, 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 reflex the tracheal or cough reflex and the pharyngeal reflex now what are the brain death criteria how do we come on to the how do we decide about uh, uh, so first and foremost is to rule out the confounders that is the uh, functional or potentially reversible causes that may mimic brain death such as drug intoxication the patient may be on cns depressants in a in a patient who is in icu would be on various uh, cns depressants sedatives hypothermia that is a core temperature of less than 32 degrees celsius other metabolic or endocrine disturbances acid based disturbances electrolyte disturbances hypophosphatemia etc shock hypotension and encephalopathy so all these treatable uh, factors confounders have to be ruled out before we move we start with a, a clinical examination of a patient as a potential uh, brain dead donor now brain death confirms irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain including the brain stem irreversibility indicates a structural or organic this is important irreversibility indicates a structural or organic brain disorder which no treatment may be reasonably expected to change or reverse 
So brainstem death we may call as the stage at which all functions of the brainstem have totally and irreversibly ceased. So there is loss of consciousness and unresponsiveness. The pupils, their shape could be different. In some, it could be round, oval, or uh, irregular. Generally, the size is four to nine millimeters. Uh, the brainstem reflex examination of the brainstem reflex reflexes again varies from in different countries. So I've enumerated the, the the various reflexes, brainstem reflexes in my previous slide. So, however, uh, the there are there are a lot of variation in the the the, the, the tests that are performed bedside. Then uh, we come to the most important confirmatory test for brain death, that is the apnea test, which is considered mandatory. It is the most important test. And however, it is controversial as well because of safety features, safety concerns. Namely, uh, it, it causes marked hypotension. Uh, it can cause severe cardiac arrhythmias or even pneumothorax. So it should be the last test to be done after we have fulfilled all the other criteria for brain death. What are the prerequisites before the apnea test is performed? The patient should be not, uh, should uh, should have a systolic BP more than 100 millimeters of mercury, a core body temperature more than 36 degrees Celsius, euvolemic, a PCO2 of between 35 and 45, with no previous evidence of hypercapnia. The apnea test. Uh, it is performed um, uh, with a pre uh, patient is pre-oxygenated. I'll just briefly mention about the apnea test. The patient is pre-oxygenated with 100% oxygen for at least 10 minutes. Uh, taking the PaO2 uh, to more than 200 millimeters of mercury. Uh, after having verified the ventilatory requirements of the patient before testing uh, and uh, ensuring that the PEEP is low, the test is performed and during test, during this test, 100% uh, oxygen is delivered at six liters per minute, either through a catheter, which goes right up to the carina, or through a, uh, through a T-piece with a CPAP of 10 centimeters of water. And we, uh, the test needs to be aborted uh, if the systolic BP falls below 90 millimeters of mercury or the SpO2 falls below 85% for more than 30 seconds. However, now it's considered that the PaCO2 value is more important than the duration of observed apnea. The exact level of PaCO2 to be achieved is still debatable. However, the, in the United States, it's considered to be 60 millimeters of mercury or more. In the UK, they consider 50 millimeters of mercury or more as the criteria for uh, uh, for having uh, considering the apnea test positive. <clears throat> Sorry. Now we come to the clinical diagnosis of brain death. So the basic principle of clinical diagnosis of brain death is threefold. First, we have to identify the cause of disease. Second, we have to exclude the potentially reversible and treatable conditions that may mimic brain death. And lastly, we have to demonstrate the clinical signs of brain death, namely coma, brainstem areflexia, and apnea. Confirmatory tests are not always mandatory, but they are desirable, especially when the clinical picture is confusing or contradictory. So uh, as per the U US requirements, two examinations at least six hours apart are required to be done by two or three physicians who are not connected with the transplantation program. And at least one of the physicians must be a specialist in neurology, neurosurgery, or anesthesiology. So after having done the clinical tests uh, of brain death, we, we, we come to the ancillary tests for brain death, which are kind of confirmatory for brain death. So because it is required by law in many European, Central American, South American, and Asian countries, uh, these should be used along with appropriate clinical judgment. The first is the EEG. Then we have ev various evoked responses. You have the cerebral perfusion and metabolism studies, which include angiography. The most common or the gold standard being contrast catheter angiography, which is a four vessel cerebral angiography. The advantages of this are that it is not influenced by CNS depressant drugs or hypothermia. However, it has some drawbacks. That is, the, uh, the patient needs to be transported to a radiology uh, suit. You can imagine a patient on ventilator and all the inotropes and vaso vasopressors being transported to the radiology suit. Uh, invasive in investigations requiring uh, neuro, uh, uh, an experienced neuroradiologist is a, another important feature of this four-vessel cerebral angiography. And it may cause 
complications such as vasospasm, arterial dissection, and thromboembolism resulting in further increase in intracranial pressure if the patient pressure is already increased. So digital subtraction uh, angiography is another alternative to uh, the contrast uh, catheter angiography. Then we have the radionuclide angiography. Uh, we have a CT angiography that can be performed again. This is um, uh, this is a CT angiography is um, is again um, uh, a non-invasive uh, procedure except that you have to in, uh, inject an intravenous agent, contrast agent. It is easily accessible around the clock in most of the hospitals, so it can uh, you know help in uh, than rather than using a contrast catheter um, angiography. Uh, it is quite fairly inexpensive and a short procedure, which takes a few minutes. And one can decide whether one wants to do a, just a plain NCC, NCCT, or uh, you can do a CT perfusion study also in the same sitting. The main disadvantage of CT uh, angiography is that there is a lot of variation between the findings of a CT angiography and the contrast catheter angiography. Then uh, we have the MRI and the MR angiography, which has to again be done in the MR, MR suite. And we have the transclan uh, transcranial Doppler ultrasonography. Now, uh, this is quite a this is an, uh, a very simple and a non-invasive, uh, inexpensive bedside procedure. However, it requires a lot of expertise at the hands of the the sonologist who's performing this. And uh, last but not the least, we have the PET imaging, which is still in an uh, early stage as an investigative modality in comatose or brain death patients. How also it is very expensive and resource intensive. So now we come to the legal issues of brain death. There is a significant variability. Significant variability exists in the policies and practices for determining brain death among nations. And also, and also uh, within the same nation between different states and hospitals. So in India, a statutory government governmental group attempted to draft a criteria for brain death in 1978, but did not meet with much success. So in the state of Maharashtra, first, the, the, the state of Maharashtra was the first to enact two, two uh, laws. One was the Bombay Corneal Grafting Act in 1957 to regulate corneal transplantation, and the other was the Maharashtra Kidney Transplantation Act 1982 to regulate kidney transplantation. So in 1984 and then in 1989, a national seminar sponsored by the National Academy of Medical Sciences and the Biomedical Ethics Committee, Ethics Center, I'm sorry, uh, recommended with minor changes, adoption of the brain death criteria used in the United Kingdom. The National Medical Journal of India, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, organized meetings to deliberate on the concept of brain death. All these, these conferences also accepted the simple, safe, and proven criteria of brainstem death as applied in the UK with minor modifications. Now, this is uh, uh, an article which, I, uh, which has come from Transplantation 2012, which delves on the evolution of the Transplantation of Human Organ Act and law in India. The principal author being Dr. Sanjay Kumar Agarwal from uh, uh, the Department of Nephrology, AIMS. So the Transplantation of Human Organ Act 1994, which we call THOA, came into being on 8 July 1994 through an act of parliament, it, which was introduced in the Lok Sabha way back on 20th August 1992. THOA 1994 uh, was enacted on 4th February 1995 in the states of Goa, Maharashtra, and Himachal Pradesh, and all the union territories. Subsequently, other states followed, except for the states of Jammu and Kashmir and Andhra Pradesh, who al already had their own uh, laws in effect. Thoa 1994 relates to regulation, storage, and transplantation of human organs for therapeutic purposes. It aims at preventing commercial dealings of human organs. It gives guidelines for certifying brain deaths, and it gives guidelines about who can give and receive donations and where donations may take place. Now, as per the Transplantation of Human Organ Act 1994, who are it, he, it also tells who can certify brain death, or it has specified who can certify brain death. It has to be a four-member committee comprising uh, a registered medical practitioner who is the primary care physician treating the patient, 
a registered medical practitioner who is in charge of the institution, namely the head of the institution, a neurologist or neurosurgeon from a notified panel, and a, re a registered medical practitioner uh, who, since the amendment bill of 2011, has been replaced by an anesthetist or intensivist. What are the limitations in Thoa 1994? There were case reports of illegal renal transplantation with possible exploitation of economically weaker sections. So the public perception was that the act had failed to curb commercialization or commercial transactions of organs. And it was also seen to hinder genuine transplant cases due to the cumbersome approvals and lengthy procedures. Significant progress in deceased donor transplantation was also not taking place in our country. So the Transplantation of Human Organ Act 1994 does not prohibit foreign nationals from getting transplantation in India. The, now, following so much of um, outcry regarding um, the misuse, uh, regarding misuse of uh, organ transplantations, the Ministry of Health and uh, Family Welfare, Government of India, held several meetings with healthcare professionals. And, um, uh, uh, and after the Istanbul, there was a famous Istanbul Declaration of 2008 regarding issues related to transplantation, which was basically to deal with the kidney transplantation. So the major concerns of healthcare professionals during this meeting with the government of India was the incentives that uh, uh, we should do away with the intense with the incentives to donors or their families. This was their concern. Then arbit arbitrary police action against physicians. So this was also without going into the merits of a case. The, uh, the this was another concern of the physicians or healthcare workers. Then they also suggested that uh, grandchildren and grandparents should also be considered in the ambit of near relatives. Okay, and also the organ retrieval centers had not been recognized as such. Sustainability of potential diseased brain dead organ donors in ICUs. So this, the cost of sustaining such potential diseased brain dead organ donors in ICUs was also brought, brought up. The, 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 to increase more organ donations, non heart beating donors were also uh, suggested. And uh, this point of lack of trained and skilled professionals, including transplant surgeons, coordinators, nurses, et cetera, was also discussed with the government of India by the healthcare professionals. So then came amendment to the rules of the Transplantation of Human Organs Act, to, which came in 2008. So it these are a few salient features of the amendment, which I'll just uh, enumerate. Uh, modification in documents or forms related to transplantation. So some forms are revised, some were added, some were deleted. Verification of all photos of donors and recipients and counter signature of the, uh, of the photographs were also required. Related donors needed to undergo detailed histocompatibility, uh, histocompatibility testing. Uh, a greater caution was advised in case of female donors. A round the clock availability of in infrastructure in designated hospitals uh, for organ transplantation, accreditation of labs by NABL and the quality control of India respective embassies and author author authorization committees to accord permission for transplantation in case of foreign nationals. So this was one thing which uh, the government of India said the foreign nationals should first all who come to India on during for medical tourism or transplant tourism should take permission from the respective embassies and also the authorization committees. And uh, this amendment, the, ru uh, um, the rules were amended also to uh, for, regarding the functioning of the authorization committee was addressed in details in this in these amendments in 2008. Then came the amendment bill, the, the Thoa Amendment Bill 2011. This was amended on 12th August 2011 by the Parliament. So some salient points were like solid organs. The term solid organs had been replaced by solid organ tissue or both. Then uh, it also said that the tissue banks needed registration by an appropriate authority. Uh, the, the, the amendment, the bill said, uh, defined separately human organ retrieval centers. Uh, it also included grandparents, grandfather, grandmother, and grandchildren added in the definition of near relatives. A transplant coordinator was thought, was, was, uh, thought to be mandatory in all hospitals conducting organ transplantation. And as I mentioned earlier, an anesthetist or intensivist was allowed to declare brain death. So he was included in the team of four. 
swap translate uh, transplantations uh, have also been allowed swap translate trans, 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 transplantations meaning that um, of, um, of the organs of one family if they are incompatible within the family can be swapped with another family for this for the same purpose of transplantation therapeutic transplantation so and um, uh, so the transplantation will not be allowed from an indian donor to a foreign recipient unless they are near relatives this was another amendment in uh, amendment in the bill passed in 2011 that uh, any uh, indian donor will not donate uh, his his, uh, his organs to a foreign recipient unless they are near relatives corneal enucleation for transplantation can be performed by technician qualified and experienced for the same central government shall maintain a national registry of donors and recipients uh, of all organs and tissues that have that are and also there were fines for illegal activities uh, which were earlier in the 1994 act which were increased uh, many fold to just to dissuade people from going uh, taking doing illegal practices So in conclusion, um, the concept of brain death has developed with the, uh, with the development of organ transplantation. And uh, we must keep in mind the dead donor rule, which is the ethical and legal axiom, which means that patients must be declared dead before removal of any, uh, uh, before removal of any organs and the retrieval of such organs before removal of any life sustaining uh, organs and the retrieval of such organs for transplantation should not cause the death of the donor so this is the main crux of um, of the uh, to ha of having to make criteria for brain death to facilitate organ transplantation because there is there is a shortage of uh, living uh, organ donors uh, and hence this this the shortage has to be uh, fulfilled by the deceased donor transplantation for which the criteria and the laws for uh, brain death have have been modified from time to time and uh, need to be practiced before uh, and certified and you know, confirmed by the regulatory authority before such a procedure can be undertaken thank you uh, thank you vivek uh, can you unshare slides please uh, so uh, what has been covered now right now has been um, the overview of the legal and the uh, aspects of uh, transplantation. Um, can you unshare, please, Naya? Yeah. Okay, and uh, can uh, uh, Nitesh, uh, can you share these slides? And uh, so, uh, what is very important, there are many legal uh, challenges in transplantation. There are a lot of lacunae which are also there in the current laws, which are there for uh, deceased organ transplantation. There is, there is a need to actually uh, strengthen the law further to make it more uh, friendly to uh, the uh, act of donor transplants. Nitish, will you please uh, share a slide? Uh, um, uh, I'm unable to see the option for uh, slide sharing. It will be below, right down. I think so. Just move your uh, cursor a bit and you'll be able to see it. Uh, uh... Yeah, it is coming. Okay. So uh, our next presentation is by Dr. Nitesh. And Dr. Nitesh, uh, yeah, can you make, put it on play? Uh, yeah, Dr. Nitesh is a specialist in critical care. He did his DM in critical care from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And before his uh, DM from critical care, he was working, uh, he was in a teaching post uh, in the medical college. And he was an uh, assistant professor before he went into this. Uh, presently, uh, he's managing the ICU the medical ICU of our hospital, Amrita Hospital at Faridabad. His areas of interest are, of course, ARDS ventilation, USG in critical care, and end-of-life care, which is a part of the same thing which we're discussing today, brain death. So brain death is a very important thing in the ICUs today because it's the ICUs which will finally prepare the patients for donor transplants. Over to you, Dr. Nitesh. Uh, very good evening, everybody, uh, and thank you, sir, for uh, your kind words. And uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Indian College of uh, Anesthesiologists for uh, offering me this uh, platform uh, to speak on such an important topic. 
So, uh, Dr. Vivek has very uh, clearly outlined the declaration of uh, brain death and the legal uh, aspects surrounding it. So, once the patient uh, gets declared brain dead, and then uh, he agrees for uh, organ donation. So, what I will be speaking is the management of brain dead organ donor in ICU. How we can optimize the donor so that maximum, uh, potentially maximum amount of uh, organs can be retrieved from the patient. So, uh, not only in India, around the world, uh, there is a significant uh, gap between the supply and demand of the organs. So, in India, we have 4 lakh people dying every day. We are every year waiting from transplant and there is a significant uh, shortage of organs. And uh, if we uh, uh, see this uh, from, uh, I have taken this from transplant observatory. So we can see that uh, towards the left is the total number of transplants, uh, including the related donor transplant. So this is significant increase over the years. However, if you see on the right screen uh, that there is also a significant amount of increase in the deceased donors but in terms of uh, per million, we are very uh, way behind. Uh, we are currently doing uh, 0.8. Uh, our organ donation rate is 0.8 per million, uh, whereas compared to USA and Spain, it is uh, 31 and 46. So a lot needs to be done, though things are coming up and people are getting more aware and uh, started to donate organs. So another important thing is that with uh, such a huge uh, mis, uh, disparity between what is, uh, uh, what is available uh, to us uh, in terms of uh, donors. So there is increased requirement of uh, older and marginal donor. So again, this uh, makes uh, the ICU uh, management of these patients even more challenging that not only they are uh, older and also have organ dysfunctions, so it's our as intensive it's, it's our increased responsibility to care for potential donors because one life uh, one individual can potentially save seven eight lives so as intensivist we can identify the potential donors early we can uh, do declaration of brain death and finally improve or uh, provide medical care to improve the rates of graft survival so key to the management of these patients is the is understanding the pathophysiology uh, behind what happens after organ donation. So if we have understanding of pathophysiology and what kind of changes uh, occur and what at what frequency, we can not only identify brain, uh, brain death early, but we can also uh, preempt it and manage it uh, more effectively. So uh, some of it uh, has already been uh, uh, discussed by Dr. Vivek. So once in the initial phase of the brain death, there is a huge sympathetic storm. There is a significant increase in the catecholamines level. It uh, rises to up to 1,000 times what is uh, normally observed, which can uh, lead to significant tachycardia, hypertension, and which can further compromise the cardiac function by increasing the afterload, development of arrhythmias, myocardial ischemia, or development of cardiomyopathy. Also, the sympathetic storm uh, and increase inflammatory mediators. They can uh, cause endothelial damage to the lungs and uh, there is increase in the hydrostatic pressures and we can develop neurogenic pulmonary edema and reduce cardiac uh, contractility can further aggravate uh, these problems. Apart from, since these patients are mostly ventilated, they can also develop ventilator-induced lung injuries, ventilator-associated pneumonias. So, multifactorial lung injury can occur. So we have cardiac injury, we have lung injury, and uh, with the hypothalamic damage, there is uh, uncoupling of the regulatory mechanism. So once the body is unable, like shivering, like vasoconstriction, these regulatory mechanisms to preserve the heat is lost. So almost nearly every patient uh, goes into hypothermia. There is significant uh, inflammatory changes, which leads to the surge in level of uh, inflammatory markers, which can further curve organ injury. There is uh, endocrine problems, which leads to depletion in, uh, decrease in uh, antidiuretic hormones. There is decrease in uh, thyroid and other problems. Stress-related hyperglycemia, 
decreased insulin secretion, this can lead to hyperglycemia. Apart from that, there is a secretion of uh, thromboplastin from the brain following the brain death, which can lead to disseminated intravascular coagulation. Hypothermia can further aggravate these problems, large volume resuscitation, and many of the patients who have uh, suffered from trauma prior to brain death, they can also have that uh, triad of metabolic acidosis, coagulation dysfunction, and so forth. Other pathophysiological uh, abnormalities can be, there can be delayed gastric emptying le leading to distension, reflux, and aspiration. And this, of course, there is intestinal inflammation and apoptosis, which can lead to bacterial translocation uh, from the gut, uh, resulting in sepsis. And also, uh, it is uh, more of a uh, uh, concern in operative theater. There can be preservation of spinal reflexes and automatism, which can be catastrophic from a uh, uh, from the standpoint of a relative who sees the if he wishes to see the patient and suddenly he sees that there is a movement of patient and so uh, this is the uh, slide showing frequency of pathophysiological changes hypothermia is almost universal so is hypotension and uh, a lot uh, vast majority will also develop diabetes insipidus arrhythmias pulmonary edema and ultimately cardiac arrest can be also associated. So in 2017, Indian Society of uh, Critical Care uh, Medicine uh, published their position statement. So most of the talk which I am uh, going uh, further from here will be speaking from this article. So our goal is to maintain hemodynamic stability to, uh, op uh, for, to maintain the optimal perfusion so that we can uh, retrieve the maximum amount, amount of organs from the brain dead patient. So the uh, management is complex and clinically challenging. There are a plethora of pathophysiological changes involving multiple organs leading to multiple organ failure. It can be time consuming right from the diagnosis to the right from the diagnosis to uh, a declaration of brain death it can take a lot of time and it can also take a lot of more lot more time uh, to finally get the organ retrieval team and uh, organ retrieval team and uh, go ahead with organ transplantation also whoever has tried to get someone to donate organ it can be a very frustrating exercise Sometimes, even if the initial uh, attendants, they agree, some, some third person will come and they'll say that, oh, no, it, it is wrong. And you will have people who have given consent and later withdrawing consent. And of course, one of the most frustrating and challenging part is key, by the time you are preparing for all this, the patient develop, may develop cardiac arrest also. So the key goals are that now we have to, once we are optimizing these patients, now the goal shifts from uh, optimizing cere cerebral perfusion pressure to maintaining hemodynamic stability. So the external ventricular drains come out, uh, the internal uh, ICP monitors come out. We don't have to give mannitol, furosemide, and 3% normal saline to maintain decrease the cerebral perfusion pressure. So there is a change in goal. So what we are trying to do is reverse or mitigate the physiological changes which are uh, occurring after the brain death. And another important aspect is that we have to balance the intervention needed for successful preservation of multiple organs. For example, if you want to harvest the lung, maybe we'll uh, go with a more restrictive uh, fluid uh, therapy and maybe use uh, dynamic monitors to create a restrictive fluid therapy as compared to if we are only harvesting uh, kidney. So we can maybe go ahead with... So it, whenever we are trying to... Uh, uh, harvest multiple organs, then it becomes a very ba difficult balancing exercise so to preserve the multiple organs. So this is the general outline, the general ICU care. This remains same for most of the patients in uh, critical care. Uh, then there is management of hemodynamics, management of metabolic derangements, temperature, respiratory support, uh, optimization of hematological parameters, and of course, infection management. So this is the list of uh, general supportive care. This is nothing uh, very specific uh, to organ donors. Hand hygiene, insertion of central and arterial line monitoring, nasogastric tube, Foley's catheter. Care of lines is very important because 
these again this is a very uh, precious patient and he is going to save lives of multiple patients uh, so we have to be very careful so that he doesn't develop infection uh, prop the position frequent change uh, change in body position warming blanket this is very important uh, nearly every patient who uh, develops brain death will ultimately land up into hypothermia so start uh, your preparation early prophylaxis again eye care important if you are generally also important plus uh, if you are trying to harvest cornea need for tracheal toileting stress ulcer prophylaxis and broad spectrum antibiotics so this is the general uh, outline the systolic blood pressure should be maintained between 100 to 120 millimeters of mercury map is more than 60 cvp 8 to 10 he hemoglobin and hematocrit 10 and 30 pH between 7.35 to 7.45, PO2 greater than 75 millimeters of mercury, PCO2 between 35 to 45, SPO2 to 95 percent, urine output, uh, sorry, there's an error, 1 to 2 ml per kg per hour. Core temperature, try to uh, maintain it uh, beyond 35 degrees Celsius and correct metabolic abnormalities. There is a simple rule of uh, thumb which we can use, that is rule of 100 systolic blood pressure more than 100 millimeters of mercury, urine output more than 100 ml per hour, PO2 more than 100, hemoglobin more than 10, and blood sugar more than 100 milligram per deciliter. Regarding monitoring, again, these patients are very time, uh, these patients are very precious and we need to monitor them very closely. Ideally, if we have sufficient manpower, a specifically dedicated nurse and a senior resident should be allotted to uh, these particular patients because not only will uh, uh, there be a lot of repeated frequent monitoring, repeated uh, testing of arterial blood gases, blood sugars, and we have to very promptly act upon that. Also, since there are multiple uh, other teams involved, someone will ask for echocardiography, someone will ask for maybe uh, angio, so, ideally, under ideal circumstances, we should have at least a dedicated uh, doctor attached to these patients. So, core temperature should be monitored, ECG, invasive blood pressure is mandatory, central venous pressure, SpO2, hourly urine output, and others. Uh, for example, echocardiography, again, there is a caveat to it. Echocardiography, initially, it may be abnormal. So wait for at least 12 to 24 hours if you have done it uh, and repeat because of the initial uh, storm, uh, initial uh, catecholamine surge, there can be cardiac dysfunction, which usually if the heart was normal before, will settle between 12 to 24 hours. In uh, complex cases with uh, decreased LV dysfunction, there may be a need to put a PA catheter. These are the routine investigations, serum electrolytes, blood sugars, ABG with lactates. These should be measured every second to fourth hourly. CBC, blood grouping, cross-matching, coagulation profile, renal, uh, liver function tests must be done. Cardiac evaluation should include a ECG and echocardiography, imaging, chest X-ray, ultrasound for abdominal organs. Microbiology, again, surveillance culture is recommended. Get the blood culture, ET aspirate, and urine and if there is any other fluid like acidic or pleural fluid. Viral markers are mandated, that is uh, at least uh, HBS antigen, HCV, HIV, and cytomegalovirus. So again, the goals of hemo hemodynamic monitoring are maintain normal volemia, control blood pressure, and this is to be done by using minimal, minimal use of vasoactive agents. So how do we go about it? Hypertensive autonomic storm is transient in nature and should be managed. Uh, the current recommendation uh, uh, from ICCM is that most of the times it does not need any uh, treatment at all. However, there are some studies which do say that the use of short-acting agents like esmolol and NTG, they have improved uh, graft functions. Of course, with uh, autonomic storm, uh, patients can develop tachyarrhythmias, which is standard management with cardio cardioversion, amidurin, Important thing is in bradyarrhythmias, since there is a loss of vagal tone, your uh, atropine is not going to work. So start with adrenal, isoprenal, and pacing. And of course, address the co underlying causes. It could be due to electrolytes, hypotension, fluid volume, and hypothermia. So after the initial uh, phase of 
after the initial phase of uh, 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 sympathetic surge, uh, ultimately the patient lands up into hypotension. So the three main uh, pillars of uh, management of hypotension in these patients is first is volume expansion, then give vasopressor support, and if it doesn't work, then hormonal therapy. So oh, hypovolemia is very common. Apart from uh, uh, severe vasoplegia, there is also uh, prior to brain death, we are using uh, osmotic diuresis. We are, if the patient develops uh, diabetes insipidus, there could be cold diuresis or there could be ongoing blood, uh, blood loss and relative adrenal insufficiency. So any medication which is contributing to hypotension like mannitol, furosemide, these should be discontinued. If there is uh, also check for signs of continuing uh, hemorrhage, if there is hemorrhage from any other side. And then take uh, fluid resuscitation to maintain the euvolumic status. Currently, there is no clear consensus on what is the ideal fluid in these patients, it will depend upon the clinical circumstances. For patients who have uh, developed diabetes in insipidus, a half NS and 5% dextrose will often be required. And uh, in, with patients who don't have that uh, and sodium uh, levels are less than 150, we can go with balanced all solutions. Important thing is to avoid colloids because uh, this may lead to renal epithelial injury, worsening of coagulation. So avoid colloids. Albumin can be used. However, again, uh, with albumin, even with low albumin, uh, low uh, sodium albumin, then uh, sodium is a concern. So, uh, like I said, in many cases, uh, for example, where you are trying to harvest multiple uh, organs, like if you are trying to take lung, then in those cases, central venous pressure uh, measuring alone is a very poor guide. So, we uh, don't want to flood the patient. So, we need to measure dynamically. Uh, like using uh, pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation, or we can uh, do repeated echoes and uh, get uh, velocity time integral. And uh, also idea from urine output that is to be maintained one to three ml per kg per hour. So following uh, uh, development of hypertension, once we have uh, uh, created an euvolumic, normal volumic state, and still if the blood pressure is low, then we need to start some vasoactivation. So currently, uh, the ISCCM recommends uh, vasopressin as the first line agent. If the MAP remains less than 60 and LV function, uh, LVF is more than 45, we can, uh, we should add uh, norepinephrine or phenylephrine. And if there is for, uh, LV dysfunction also, then we can selectively use dobutamine, do dopamine and epinephrine. So uh, this is a, a basic outline. Uh, once the patient develops autonomic storm, hypertension usually does not require any treatment. If hemodynamically significant bradyarrhythmia is there, isoprotenol or epinephrine, institute basic monitoring. The goal is to maintain a MAP more than 70, urine output more than 1 ml per kg per hour with minimum vasopressor support. However, if despite this, the patient is unstable, then uh, create... Uh, give fluids, half, uh, half normal saline, balance all solution. And still if the hypotension persists, start uh, the patient on vasoactive agents. First line is your vasopressin. Second is norepinephrine, epinephrine or feline. And if the instability still persists, then we can consider placement of pulmonary artery catheter, trans esophageal uh, echocardiography or, or advanced uh, monitors of uh, advanced cardiac output monitors and uh, <clears throat> Goals is to achieve a cardiac index more than 2.4, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure between 8 to 12, and a stroke volume variation less than 12. So once we have created a euvolumic state, we have started our vasopressors, and still we are not uh, we have not achieved our hemodynamic goals, then we can give hormone replacement therapy. So uh, though there is uh, no clear consensus on this, however, it has been observed in uh, some studies that hormone replacement leads to improve in high hemodynamics, reduced vasopressor requirements, increase in the number of expanded uh, right area donors, and also improve in the post-transplant uh, organ function. So what is uh, the current recommendation? Vasopressin, again, it helps both ways. It also gives a vaso as a vasoactive agent and also will uh, decrease your uh, diabetes insipidus. So one unit bolus followed by infusion of 0.5 to 4, methylprednisolone 50 mil 15 milligram per kg immediately after the diagnosis of brain death 
and every 24 hours following insulin infusion should be used to maintain a blood glucose level between 80 to 150 milligram per deciliter thyroxine though iv thyroxine uh, i have not used much there is a recommendation for iv thyroxine however if unavailable uh, it can be given via uh, rt that is 300 to 400 microgram every 8 hourly Like I said, again, there is a very high percentage of uh, patients who will develop uh, diabetes insipidus, diagnosed by urine output, uh, 4 ml per more than 4 ml per kg per hour, serum sodium more than 145, serum osmolality more than 300, urine osmolality less than 300, and specific gravity less than 1.05. But remember, we don't have uh, to wait for all the criteria to be met if you are suspecting that the patient has a traumatic brain injury and suddenly the patient has developed a uh, large volume of urine output more than four, uh, 4 ml per kg per hour for last uh, uh, two hours, two, three hours, and he's showing other signs of uh, perhaps brain death, then we can directly go ahead with a prophylactic uh, dose of uh, desmopressin. Uh, that is uh, 10 milligram, uh, one to two nasal puffs, uh, each can around 10 to 20 uh, mcg every four hours. And we can start vasopressin infusion at 0.5 to 2 units per hour. Electrolytes need to be measured every uh, two to four hours. And our target is to maintain uh, nearly the normal status that is around 135 to 155 for sodium, potassium 4 to 5, and other. Metabolic acidosis, if there is a significant uh, acidosis or uh, acidosis, it should be corrected. Our target is to achieve a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. Temperature management, again, like I said, prevention of hypothermia is easier compared to its reversal. So effort should be made to maintain temperature above 35 degrees Celsius. In all patients, at least have a surface warming, at least give warm blanket. And if the uh, temperature goes below 34 degrees Celsius, then active warming is recommended. Ventilation, there is uh, nothing uh, specific about uh, ventilation uh, in these patients per se. Uh, uh, now, for most of the ICU patients, whatever be the diagnosis, lung protective uh, ventilation is recommended. So, we have to use a low tidal volume that is 6 to 8 ml per kg body weight and uh, low PEEP, relatively uh, intermediate PEEP and the goal is to achieve a PCO2 of 35 to 45, uh, PO2 more than uh, 75, and uh, it should be uh, generated with the more lowest possible PEEP that we can give. PEEP and FIO2, sorry. So apart from that, uh, we require suctioning, positioning, VAB bundle. Again, uh, like uh, we always discussed that uh, whether to give conservative or live, uh, fluid resuscitation will depend upon the organs that we are trying to harvest. Uh, hematological management, uh, active bleeding should be corrected. INR, the target, if INR is more than 1.5, uh, then again, it needs to be corrected and target hematocrit is more than 30%. Finally, coming to infection management, these patients are very predisposed to infections because of uh, impairment of immune system. We have put in multiple invasive lines and also there is a increase in gut translocation of the bacteria. However, even with uh, around 20 to 30 percent patients who have been declared uh, uh, brain dead will have some sort of infection. However, this just does not get translated into a transmission of uh, to the donor. It is uh, less than one to five percent. So uh, sepsis or bacteremia per se is not a contraindication except for um, uh, if the patient is in a full-blown septic shock condition. Then we don't uh, procure the organs. Uh, so bacteremia or sepsis are not contraindication provided that ant spe specific antibiotics have been administered for at least 48 hours prior to uh, procurement. No role of prophylactic antibiotics. However, again, uh, since with uh, SIRS and uh, uh, it is di very difficult to identify the patients who develop infection. Principle of antimicrobial therapy is similar. Now, what happens if the patient, uh, when once we are we have started this brain uh, death and then organ optimization, we send cultures and uh, it, it takes time. Uh, it often takes uh, time, a couple of uh, days for the, the entire thing to get sorted out. And we have a donor who has a positive blood culture. 
So now again, this is not a contraindication. We have to treat the patient for uh, 48 hours. And then if things are okay, we can go ahead with organ retrieval. If the uh, recipient comes, uh, if the once we have uh, transplanted, harvested the organ and transplanted it, and then the cultures come, then we have to treat the recipient for seven to 10 days. Uh, invasive fungal infection, uncontrolled sept uh, septic shock, and undiagnosed febrile illness, encephalitis, meningitis, flaccid paralysis of unknown cause, and uh, lymphocorio meningitis virus and rabies are these are the absolute contraindication for organ donation. Renal replacement therapy, if we are using, uh, if the patient is oliguric, anuric, we are having issues with uh, uh, management of volume and acidosis, then of course we can institute renal replacement therapies. There's no contraindication. And uh, the ideal modality of choice is CRRT. Uh, stress ulcer prevention and uh, venous thrombomolars, they should be continued as in most of the patients. Again, uh, this is just a slide to show that uh, Keep in mind that there are a lot of uh, medicines which are hepatotoxic and nephrotoxic. And uh, we need to remember that uh, we need to check our charts that whether we are giving these medicines or not, and then adjust them accordingly. Another very important thing is it is very, uh, it is a good idea to protocolize these things. Uh, this is uh, one of the extended uh, care bundles that I have uh, taken from uh, NHS. So there are various, uh, our cardiovascular targets, respiratory targets, they are predefined. And uh, so we can uh, uh, protocolize these things and uh, do uh, in a, and uh, create a checklist so that we may, we will be doing uh, it after a repeated, multiple repeated times, we are uh, maintaining a consistency and in the quality of care. So to conclude, brain death is a, is frequently followed by a predictable pattern of multi-organ failure. And uh, also remember that the management of potential donor begins way before declaration of brain death. So the moment you have identified that this is a potential donor and this uh, individual may develop brain death, the management starts from there because it will take time for, for you to uh, certify the patient Brain death. So our management starts right from the beginning. The moment you have identified that this patient has a potentially brain death, we start our management and early identification and intervention. This can significantly increase both the number and quality of organs harvested. Thank you very much. With this, I conclude my. Uh, thank you, Nitish. Can you unshare, please? Uh, so Nitish has uh, very uh, nicely given the entire view of different um, management of different organs and during uh, the preparation for the transplant that is in the ICU. And in the last slide, which he very rightly said, you have to start uh, looking for the management of a brain dead donor much before brain death is declared. This is a very important aspect. You cannot delay it till the brain death is declared and then prepare. Not only that, the even the transplant coordinators should start working on the relative of the patient the moment you feel that this patient is likely to be brain dead. Another important thing which I picked up from his uh, uh, first three, three, uh, two or three slides was that Spain has the highest number of brain dead donors. And it is very important to understand this because the Spanish society is very much like the Indian society, very family oriented so society. If a family oriented society like Spain can have such good amount of donations, organ donations, I, it is uh, not understood why in our country we cannot develop the same amount of donations. So it's very important that we uh, get into that and we start doing. Uh, Dr. Neeti, can you please share your slides? Yeah. So uh, Dr. Neeti will be presenting the last part of this webinar. And this the last part of this webinar is on the management of brain dead donors in the operating room. And Dr. Neeti Gulati uh, is a senior consultant in anesthesiology at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. She's got a, a, a large amount of interest in difficult airway management, ultrasound and regional anesthesia, resuscitation, trauma and organ transplant. She has uh, been a, a big promoter of, in, in the NOTO guidelines. She has been uh, teaching NOTO guidelines to lots of people. And she's got a, a great passion for running workshops on difficult airway and ultrasound and regional anesthesia. And, of all, and also resuscitation. Over to Dr. Neeti. Thank you, sir. Good evening. And uh, thank you, ICO, for giving me this opportunity. 
So I'll be dealing with the brain dead donor, the role of anesthesiologist in the management in the OT. Thank you, Nitish. You have already passed on the baton to me. So anesthesiologists play a very important role, carrying the last baton in the relay race, carrying the gift of organs to so many families. And yes, we take the lead or cover up the lost ground, just like an athlete do in the baton relay race. So the key role will be the continuum of the ICU care. We share about the consent and the contraindication. Anesthetist is like a sutradhar. He is a big communicator and the boss of the OT who do a lot of work with the retrieval team. So either we go with the rush and retrieve approach or with a relax and repair approach. Relax and repair approach is like we are waiting and repairing the donor organ. Be sure about the pathophysiology of the brain that donor. Make sure your OT is well prepared and warm. Be sure about your hormonal cocktail. Take care of the post-op ritual and take home message. So according to the American Academy of Neurology 2010 guidelines, we defined a brain dead as irreversible coma, brainstem areflexia, and a confirmed two apnea test. So as an anesthesiologist, I have got a role in brain dead certification as per the new amendment. But the anesthetist should not be the part of the transplant team. The one who is the part of the brain dead certification is not the part of the transplant team. As an anesthetist and as an anesthetist in the OT, where the anesthetist is doing the donor management goals, we are moving from patient to organ preservation. These are basically the list of contraindications like bacterial infections, sepsis and gangrenous bowel, acute viral infections like rabies, HIV, fungal infections, aspergillosis candidiasis, malaria, critical Jacob disease, aplastic anemia, extreme immaturity such as the weight less than 500 gram and gestation less than 32 weeks. Previous malignancy with current metastasis. Current malignancy except non-melanoma, remote prostate cancer, and primary CNS tumor with no meds. Hematological malignancy. So we all have discussed the pathophysiology of a brain dead patient. So how does the pathophysiology start? It starts with the increase in the intracranial pressure that leads to a catecholamine storm that leads to a surge in the catecholamines which cause a neurogenic pulmonary edema. There is increased capillary permeability and they all lead to ultimately the decrease in the oxygen delivery. There are tachyarrhythmias and the hypertension response and bradyarrhythmias. Then there is spinal infarction and there is hypothalamic posterior pituitary which is first affected. There is hypothalamic pituitary axis that is being deranged. So the most important hormone abnormality that is first found is the diabetes insipidus followed by a pan hypopituitary state. Thyroxine insufficiency, adrenaline and then there is a catecholamine depletion with increase in the cytokines and SIRS syndrome or sepsis is there. So with diabetes insipidus, there is hypovolemia and increase in the sodium. With loss of thyroid and other sympathetic deactivation that is being followed, there is ischemia and there is acidosis, which leads to the metabolic acidosis and increase in the lactate. But spinal reflexes are intact. So there is involuntary movements, which is mediated by the spinal reflex. So again, this is the same revision of the slide that there is an increase in the ICP leading to catecholamine storm, followed by a spinal cord infarction leading to loss of the sympathetic tone, followed by a pan hypopituitary state. What is happening in the lungs? There is neurogenic pulmonary edema, there is increased capillary permeability, there is cytokine storm, which is further being added on by the patient being on the ventilator, ventilatory associated pneumonia. There may be aspiration insult or maybe he is a trauma patient. 
the most common hormonal abnormality that is first is diabetes insipidus which is followed by the pan hypopituitary state so now where is my role my role is being the continuation of the icu care that is carried forward and now we are moving from the patient to the donor specific management that is oxygen restoration so my main aim and my main goal is restoring the oxygen so there is a beautiful pneumonia that is ventilation infusion pumping pharmacological treatment and specific intervention and there is a very easy rule of 100 already been told hemoglobin more than 10 systolic blood pressure this is systolic blood pressure more than 100 urine output more than 100 pulmonary artery oxygen pressure 100 and sugar 100 mg per deciliter this is again the targets that we have to follow that my heart rate is between 60 to 120 mean arterial pressure is above 70 central venous pressure so this is again whatever we are following in our anesthesia in a very sick patient that we go for a goal directed therapy so here also if i am going for a lung and i am going for a heart lung transplant i go with a low cdp same if i have to go for a kidney or liver then again a modest amount of iv fluid i have to use maintaining a cvp towards the 6 to 10 range urine output between the 0.5 to 3 ml per kg per hour whenever it is more than 4 ml per kg per hour you go your antenna this thing that your patient is moving towards the diabetic insipidus and make sure your electrolytes are between 130 to 150 because again high sodium goes towards the diabetic insipidus and the patient who have got high sodium they become a very poor liver donor go for normal electrolytes and sugar between 80 to 140 mg per deciliter blood gas optimizing your ph and partial pressure of oxygen and if a pulmonary catheter is inserted then pulmonary capillary wedge pressure between 6 to 10 mm of mercury and monitoring the cardiac index so now what is my ot preparation it's just like i'm preparing for a very uh, sick patient a high risk patient and you are anticipating major shift then i prepared my ot a warm ot because all these patients are poikilothermic and hypothermia is the main thing that is happening in these patients so warmer warm fluids and balanced crystalloid solution other i go with a balanced crystalloid solution and if the patient is already having high sodium then i go with the 0.45% saline you can colloid has got not much role because they have not find any improvement in the graft function so better to use the crystalloids invasive monitoring all these patients are already having invasive lines infusion pump and running infusion pumps antibiotics cephalosporin standard monitoring ecg oximetry cvp arterial temperature and urine output good two to three suction machines pulmonary artery catheter monitory and emergency drug trolley and a crash cart ready with a defibrillator inside the ot so now my target is towards the organ preservation cpr now if i have to do cardiopulmonary resuscitation so my target of cardiopulmonary resuscitation is towards the organ preservation these are basically the pre op investigations keeping in mind the complete blood count grouping cross matching coagulation profile rft with electrolytes sugar urine analysis complete liver function test abg lactate imaging and more important is the cultures especially the endotracheal tube aspiration blood urine or any other fluid like acetic fluid so this is a basically checklist like we have in our ot is a surgical checklist so if i am taking my patient as a brain dead donor i am taking the patient to the ot so i should have a checklist for a donation brain dead patient making sure the patient profile name age sex admission number blood group admission diagnosis what was the admission diagnosis of the patient 
what was the past medical history what comorbidities he was having prior to it diabetic hypertension alcoholic smoking drug abuse liver and kidney derangements physical assessment of the patient is important that includes height and the weight pulse blood pressure temperature period of oliguria or anuria last hour output and if any cardiac arrest episodes were there medications steroids antibiotics vasopressors transfusion and iv fluid lab data avo blood group viral markers electrolytes lft kft abg microbiological data and troponin level in all cardiac arrest cases and obviously echocardiography and has the diagnosis of brain death been entertained and certified your time of brain death is being certified form 10 of noto consent has been taken form 8 of noto all the details of organ has been mentioned now while i am transferring the patient from icu to ot there is exact continuum of care that is i am carrying forward from icu to ot so i have to take care of the lines all the infusion running make sure my ventilator is proper a good ventilator and muscle relaxant because we'll be talking about the involuntary movements that happens in these patients in brain dead patients so i'll make sure that my muscle relaxant has been given in the icu only and a good monitor is there during the transfer so this is basically the surgical incision that is happening so this is from the midline this is the midline from sternotomy till the whole laparotomy from the vanebrum sternae to the symphysis hai na so we'll see the order of retrieval of the organs that we followed and we have to give heparin 300 international unit per kg that is before the clamping because after that cold perfused solution will be infused inside the body of the patient we initially keep the cvp low from 6 to 10 because we'll see the order of retrieval of the organ so we have to give a dry lung a good dry donor lung and then we can increase the cvp from 2 to 10 to 12 so now my anesthesia is not for the patient my anesthesia is for the organ preservation so what is the role of volatile agent there is a good role of volatile agent they reduce the autonomic spinal reflex arc here the patient is unconscious but the spinal reflex arc is intact so to reduce that autonomic spinal reflex arc because that can cause hypertension and tachycardia and further arrhythmias in the patient for that and also for the ischemic preconditioning because studies have found that volatile agents are very good for the ischemic precondition of the donor so there is a role of volatile agents then opioids are also used to reduce the autonomic reflex initially it was like a, this thing you don't have to give anything they have brain dead but they have got an autonomic intact spinal reflex arc we have to give them opioids we have to give them volatile agents and we have to give them neuromuscular blocking drugs there is a lazarus sign or a mass reflex this is the somatic movements which are uninhibited spinally mediated reflexes that occur in response to stimuli such as surgical incision or manipulation even after brain death and it occurs in 40% of brain dead individuals it starts with stretching of the arms followed by crossing or touching of the arms on the chest and finally falling of the arms alongside the torso so this could be a very disturbing sight for the attendants even for the ot staff so we have to make sure that the neuromuscular blocking agent any agent pancronium or vecuronium has been given before shifting the patient from icu to ot so this is again the same thing that we follow whenever there is an autonomic strom there is hypertension this is a very brief hypertension and doesn't require much of the treat treatment and if you want to give give a very short acting beta blocker like esmolol 
same thing if there are bready arrhythmias there is no role of atropine because there is no vagal parasympathetic output flow that is there in the body so we have to use a beta mimetic drug isoprenal or epinephrine we have to follow the basic monitoring and we have to keep the systolic above 100 of mean arterial pressure above 70 maintain a good urine output and minimal vasopressor requirement because they have seen that if you give more of norepinephrine ultimately it leads to increase in the capillary permeability and mesenteric ischemia and renal ischemia so we have to use minimal vasopressor and the vasopressor of choice is vasopressin if suppose your ejection fraction is less than 45 percent you can add dobutamine if it is more than 45 percent we start with the vasopressin so patient is instable we give more of fluid and we follow the dynamic monitoring along with the CVP, that is stroke volume variation and pulse volume variation. And we use the first line drug as vasopressin. Again, the patient is instable. We monitor further dynamics, echo, and try to maintain these goals. If that is not there, we move on to the hormone replacement therapy. So what is hormone replacement therapy? The United Network for Organ Sharing tells that there is a pan hypopituitarism that is happening inside the body. So it's a very good role of methylprednisolone, thyroxine along with vasopressin. So methylprednisolone, 15 milligram per kg or one gram IV every 24 hours. Thyroxine, if you don't have IV, we should give through the nasogastric tube that is 300 microgram eight hourly. Even though there is no low this thing but there is a sick u thyroid syndrome that is happening vasopressin one unit followed by two to four unit per hour and insulin infusion to maintain the blood sugar level if there is diabetes inspirus without hypotension we can go vasopressin we can use the nasal puff but if there is hypotension we have to give vasopressin so the cold ischemia time is the time interval that starts from the time I have clapped my big vessels after giving heparin and the perfusion of the cold perfusate is started. So the order of retrieval is heart 4 hours, lung 4 to 6 hours, liver 6 to 12 hours, small intestine 6 to 12 hours, pancreas 12 to 80 and kidney 24 hours. Organ specific targets. If my main target is not the patient right now, the my main target is the organ. So the ventilation, a good lung donor is with ventilation days less than five. The most important thing is PO2 by FiO2 ratio. The PO2 by FiO2 ratio should be more than 300. We have matched the high chest circumference. Smoking, if the patient is a smoker, less than 20 pack years. Infectional surveillance being taken care of we go with a low tidal volume ventilation. This is very important that we go with a low tidal volume ventilation, 6 to 8 ml per kg with good amount of P. My static airway pressure, that is the negative inspiratory force, is less than 30 centimeter of water. Preventing VAP, head up in the ICU, lowest possible FiO2, a dry lung, and absence of purulent secretions. We can go for the prone ventilation and pressure control ventilation. If I'm retrieving thoracic organs, so once a surgeon is retrieving inspection, inspecting the heart, we have done the echo and checked the intracardiac pressure and given the optimum goal. Once we are cannulating the superior vena cava, I need to pull out the central venous line. And iota is cannulated before that heparin is given and then it is followed by a cold cardioplegia solution. For lungs, inspection, just before you have to recruit those lungs with good amount of oxygen and then they are disconnected at full inspiration. In the abdomen, aorta is claw stemmed. That time has to document because from there the cold ischemia time starts. So this is very important that you note down the time of the cross clamping of iota because then it is flush with the cold perfusate solution and you make sure that the suction catheter 
that is taking it, removing these things from the vena circulation. Since liver has got a dual supply, so inferior mesenteric vein also have to be ligated, allowing the portal circulation to get the cold perfusate. In case we are also harvesting pancreas, so we have to do iodine decontamination through the nasogastric tube. So just to give few insights about the donation after circulated death. This is, was the earlier being followed. So this is basically reintroduced. This is the irreversible cessation of cardiac function, earlier called as the non heart beating donor. This differs from the donation after brain death. How does it differ? Because there is no neurological criteria that is required. There is no immunogenic death. There are no inflammatory parameters. There is no catecholamine strong. There is no inflammatory cytokines release in the body that is there. But wherever DCD is practiced widely, the organ donation is often considered a part of end of life care. Because we have to remember dead donor rule, as Vivek sir has said, the requirement that organ retrieval must not result in the death of the patient. This must be respected. So this is works on the withdrawal of life support treatment. And we have to follow the, there we talked about the cold ischemia time. Here we talk about the warm ischemia time. That is the time from which the circulation gets ceases. And this is, uh, this is the minimum functional warm ischemia time. So this is when there is a hypoxia and hypotension. This is called an agonal phase. That is systolic is less than 50 millimeters of mercury. Saturation less than 70%. So how do we diagnose the donation after circulatory death? Five minutes of pulseless warm ischemia. That means from the time my perfusion has stopped in the donor. So five minutes of continuous asystole is sufficient to ensure that both consciousness and respiration have ceased. So warm ischemia time is 120 minutes in kidney, liver 30, pancreas 30 and lung 60 minutes. So this is basically a modified mass fish classification in donation after circulated death. So here you can see that the class 2 and class 3 we can do. Class 2 is the unsuccessful resuscitation. This is also uncontrolled. The control one is the where we are anticipating the cardiac arrest happening in the ICU and the emergency department. Because we can use these patients also, because they are not immunogenic, one thing. The other thing is, in case of donation after brain death, you need to declare the patient brain death. In these cases, we don't need that neurological criteria. So we can also use the fourth category where the cardiac arrest is there in a brain dead donor. This is a University of Wisconsin scoring that predicts breathing post withdrawal of life care. So I have withdrawn my life care. So how long I can predict that my patient can breathe? So in this criteria, there is the respiratory rate, tidal volume, negative inspiratory force, and number of spontaneous respiration. This has been given the score of nine. Then considering the BMI, vasopressor. The patient who is on two vasopressor is being given the score of three. Age, more than 50, giving the score of three. Patient is having endotracheal tube, the score is 3. Oxygenation after 10 minutes, if it is less than 79% is 3. So this scoring predicts the breathing, how long the donor continue to breathe after the withdrawal of the care. So you can see that if it is less than 12, there is a high risk of continuing to breathe after actuation. If it is 19 to 24, it is a low risk. See, again, this is the organ donation rate in India is 0.8% as compared to 46.9% in Spain or 31.96% in USA. That is the percent per million. So we can see that in 2019, the number of actually disease donor organ donation rate was 0.52%. And we can see that after DCD, it's very less. So we can go for DCD, but first of all, we have to understand that DBD, if that DBD patient is, we are not able to follow the neurological criteria, then we can go for DCD. And in DCD patients, 
like kidney they have found almost similar this thing but in liver definitely the graft function is not so good lungs it still need to be evaluated so this is still in the infancy stage but again due to the paucity of donor we have to consider both the scenarios so just before i sum up donor is dead so the drugs given are not for anesthesia but to attenuate the physiological response my aim is to optimize the quality of the donor that is the donor management goals icu care is continued till the ot the communication between the anesthesiologist and the retrieval team is the key to successful donation make sure your documentation is complete and teamwork is followed it's very important to remember the rule of 100 and the hormonal cocktail you shift the patient to icu post surgery because this is very important if there are mlc cases you need to have a forensic person inside the ot who take the organ which are necessary for the forensic examination and then rest of the organ are taken by the retrieval team if there is a unexpected lesion or any finding in the ot that decision has to be taken with the all the teams like ret retrieval team then there is a mohan foundation which we an ngo which works very much for this donor there is an organ optimization app that we can download in our phone that gives you all the brief rules that we have to follow the vasopressor the rule of 100 and the hormonal cocktail doses why this is important because every anesthetic should know about the anesthetic management of the organ donor it's not that i have to know because i am working in a transplant center no there is a role of non transplant organ retrieval centers any center can have this so every anesthetist should know what is the anesthetic management what is the rule of 100 and what is the hormonal cocktail and what is the monitoring and the surveillance and a checklist before the ot so donation can provide a dignified death and legacy for the donor and a sense of meaning for the family as a anesthetist i am the last leg who pass the baton of the a hope of life to the recipient family and we should all pledge to organ donation especially when there is a november 27 that is coming that is the national organ donation day thank you um, thank you niti for a very comprehensive coverage of the entire management of a uh, brain dead donor in the operating room uh, it's a, a very it's a big challenge actually uh, when multiple organs have to be taken out for one patient and uh, who ca comes in first it's a it's so that's also a critical decision who comes in first who takes which organ first and that becomes very difficult and especially uh, in our center we are targeting multiple organs simultaneously so it becomes a challenge who comes in first and a lot of time is required actually to plan out this uh, thank you very much for covering it very uh, comprehensively thank you all the speakers for discussing the legal aspects to the icu aspects to the operating room aspects of management of such donors we need to uh, pledge i mean all of us need to pledge that we should promote uh, uh, organ donation in the country and uh, unless we educate people on the management of organ donation i think it won't be it will be half hearted if we just pledge and we do not actually uh, educate people about everything about the uh, donation of organs uh, with that uh, this i conclude the webinar i have